This video is part of a series of presentations covering key concepts of virtualization and its application to cloud computing. This specific presentation provides a detailed overview of how hypervisors and virtualization are used for offering different types of cloud computing services. The key motivation for virtualization is server consolidation to enable efficient use of hardware, desktop virtualization to run multiple operating systems, and to ease security and testing. There are two types of hypervisors. Type 1 hypervisors run directly on hardware, versus Type 2 hypervisors are like normal programs that run on top of a host operating system and run different operating systems inside virtual machines that are created by Type 2 hypervisors. Cloud computing essentially takes all of these features to the next level. Cloud computing essentially runs many virtual machines using hypervisors. So essentially, cloud computing is virtual machines on steroids. Cloud computing typically is performed on many servers in a large building called a data center. So essentially, a data center is just rows and rows of machines. You can look at some of these videos on different types of data centers if you're interested. Cloud computing essentially further increases the efficiencies that are enabled by virtualization using hypervisors. One, cloud computing enables even further improvements in efficiency due to sharing of large hardware resources. Resources are typically aggregated to support data intensive applications. So you, instead of rather having uh, building individual hardware platforms, you can utilize shared infrastructures for supporting large data applications. Because they are shared, it minimizes investments, maintenance, and operation costs. Cloud computing provides what is known as elasticity, which is the ability to uh, increase or decrease your hardware utilizations based on your demand. So you normally, if you have low demand, you can use less resources. And suddenly, if your demand grows or increases, you can now start adding more machines or spinning up more virtual machines to accommodate the workloads on your cloud. And once the demand decreases, you can turn them off. That means you can elastically increase and decrease the number of virtual machines you're using to manage the workload appropriately. And of course, it's very convenient for users. Let me look at examples of how convenient it is to utilize uh, cloud computing infrastructure from Amazon. Let's do a quick tour of a data center to get a mental model of what a data center is. A data center essentially consists of many computers racked together in a large building. Essentially, a data center just is a bunch of computers. So when you look around a data center, all you'll see is racks and racks of computers that are powered and cooled Typically, there's nobody in a data center. In a data center, the lights are usually off because there are no humans in the data center. And access to all of the data center uh, is controlled uh, physically by lots of different security measures. But most of the access and operations in the data center are just conducted remotely via network by connecting to individual servers and then using different types of software systems to manage these servers. So most of the work and the infrastructure of a cloud computing is done by system software developers and engineers who develop the software and the operating systems to manage, control, monitor, and uh, perform the different operations on the cloud computing infrastructure in these data centers. There are different types of clouds that are available. The most common ones are public clouds, and these are infrastructures that are made available to large industries or to the public. And these are examples like the Amazon uh, uh, Cloud or Google's Cloud are examples of public clouds. Private clouds are cloud computing infrastructures that are solely maintained for a given organization. So that means you have to be part of that big company in order to be able to use their cloud computing infrastructure. There are community clouds that so typically universities maintain these community clouds which are shared with different organizations and that can be used by a community of people 
um, as for their cloud computing operations. And there are hybrid clouds where it can be a composition of two or different types of clouds. So you can have public or private clouds, or like a combination of those, in order to give more features and functionality that would not be available just by one of these three uh, earlier types of clouds. Cloud computing is a big business. It uses internet technologies to offer scalable and elastic services. Keep in mind here the term elastic computing refers to the ability to dynamically create new virtual machines or dynamically shut down virtual machines so you can increase or decrease the amount of resources based on the workload that you're experiencing. The resources used for cloud computing can be metered, that means you can record uh, what, how much CPU, memory, and network is being used by the virtual machine, and then you can charge the users based on the resources that are being used by the specific virtual machine uh, that the user is running. Maintenance, security, and all of the services are provided by the service provider. That means Amazon, Google will maintain those machines and provide security versus you as a user can just run the software on the hardware that's managed by somebody else. And these service providers like Google and Amazon can operate more efficiently due to specialization, centralization of resources. They have a lot of custom software and hardware that makes your life easier. There are different approaches for providing services on the cloud. The first one is called software as a service. Here, the cloud computing solution provider just gives you a software. This one is the most easiest to use, but you typically won't have many features that you can customize. So this is not very flexible, but it's very easy to use. Just click a few buttons and you're ready to go. Um, platform as a service is like a, a pre-set up operating system or pre-set up environment in which you can start running a program. So typically, if you're developing a web application, you can say, oh, I want a web application that's running PHP or a web application that's running Python. And then you'll get a platform so you can just copy your files and it'll start running on the cloud, uh, on the virtual machine that is set up on a cloud. The last one is called infrastructure as a service. This one is the most uh, flexible uh, and highly customizable. So essentially you just get a virtual machine here and you can set up your own hardware, uh, own software, own operating systems. But it requires a certain level of technical skill to install an operating system, set up software. So the amount of uh, technical skill you will need is much more in infrastructure as a service. Let's do a slightly deeper dive into each one of these delivery models. Let's start with software as a service delivery model. Here, applications are provided by the service provider. That means all of the software is already set up, pre-configured, and provided by the service provider. The user does not manage or control any of the underlying infrastructure, software, or the individual application. Everything kind of comes pre-configured, more or less. So this type of service, or SaaS, software as a service, that's what SaaS stands for, is typically used by in enterprise services, like you want to have predefined desktop software, predefined workflow management, predefined solutions. Typically, you use it for Web 2.0 applications. Like, for example, Google Docs is a great example, or Google Presentation. Here, you don't do any service. You just log on, and Google Docs, you open up and start typing. But you will not be able to run anything other than Google Docs on Google Docs, right? It's same way with Google Presentation. So that's what software as a service means. It's like you're running a pre-configured software, everything is set up, and then it works this way, and you have to just like it. That's what software as a service is. But it's very easy, right? You just click and you're ready to go. That's the idea of software as a service. Keep in mind, software as a service is, of course, not suitable for like real-time applications or if you have very custom software and such, software as a service will not work. Platform as a service, or PAAS, as the acronym suggests, allows the user to deploy certain custom software using some custom programming languages and tools that are supported by the service provider. The user has some control over the uh, applications that are deployed. Uh, so for example, you can say, oh, I want a P I'm going to deploy a PHP application or a Python application, or I'm going to uh, deploy a C++ application. 
but you kind of have to choose what type of a platform you want. So the platform and the operating system environment is set up for you, and then you deploy your program or application on top of that platform. The user cannot manage the underlying hardware infrastructure like networking, servers, operating systems, all of those are pre-set up in the platform. So it does make your life easier right here. You just say, oh, I want all of this, and then you only work with your program on top of that. So platform as a service is not useful when you want your application to be portable, like you want different operating systems and such. If you want very custom programming languages or libraries, the platform may not be pre-set up for it, so you may not be able to use one of the predefined platforms. And you will not be able to customize hardware or software to improve the performance of application. You kind of get a cookie cutter platform and then you work within it. This is where infrastructure as a service, or IaaS as the acronym is, enables the most flexible or cu most customizable uh, infrastructure. Essentially, the cloud service provider gives you a virtual machine. Um, keep in mind, even here, you do not control the underlying hardware. You only can manage your virtual machine. However, within the virtual machine, you can deploy and run any software that you want. So that means you can create your own, run your own custom operating system and custom applications. You have full control over your the guest operating system that you're running, what type of storage that it needs. You have some control on the networking components, like what type of firewalls you want to use and things like that in your host operating system. And here, the service offered by this delivery model, you'll typically use it for making very custom web servers or custom database servers. If you want custom computing hardware, like you want your own GPUs and things like that, then you would go with infrastructure as a service model. And you can also use many virtual instances if you want to do some custom load balancing, manage web traffic in different ways, you would go with infrastructure as a service. Let's do a quick uh, recap of the different category, service categories. First, we looked at software as a service. Here, the service provider runs a specific software like Google Docs and Microsoft 360 and so on. The second option, which is a little bit more flexible, is platform as a service. Here, you get a specific platform or a custom set of software, operating systems, and tools. And then you, as a user, can install a little bit more software, like deploy a PHP application or Python application and start working on top of that. The last category is the most flexible one or infrastructure as a service. Here, the cloud service provider just gives you a VM and you can customize any operating system or software that you want in the infrastructure as a service. Now let's look at how we could use a virtual machine or infrastructure as a service on top of a Amazon Web Services cloud just to give an example on how a cloud computing service provider might operate. Cloud computing solution providers essentially provide a streamlined user interface that eases creation, management, and use of virtual machines. The user interface that are provided by companies essentially run commands on the Linux server in the back, similar to how we did with QEMU. So here, I'm going to try and launch a virtual machine on Amazon's web services. So here, I click on Launch a Virtual Machine. And here, it first gives me the different kinds of operating systems that I could use to start up my virtual machine. So I could pick up any other operating systems that I really want to use. But in this case, I'm just going to pick up the default one that Amazon provides. And then once you do that, Amazon then gives you different choices for how many different CPUs or how many cores you would like to use on this machine, the memory and the storage types. So you can use uh, computers with eight cores and 32 gigabytes of memory and so on. Here, I'm just going to use one of those free tier um, virtual machines. So I don't have to really pay much for it. And it's asking me to look at all of the usage and launch. So I'm going to launch that virtual machine. And in order to connect to the virtual machine, particularly over SSH, uh, here it, uh, Amazon Web Services uses what's known as a private key, which is synonymous to a password. I know my private key. If you don't have a private key, you can create a new keypad and download the private key. Here I'm going to use the private key that I already have and start the instance. Now Amazon 
runs the commands in the back and starts up a virtual machine. Here the virtual machine is currently booting up and I have to wait for some time for the virtual machine to for the kernel to stop of start and the virtual machine to boot. Meanwhile, I still can connect through an IP address that Amazon provides. I'm going to copy my IP address here and then switch over to a terminal and I'm going to use the IP address. Here I've got my private key, the user ID is easy to use here, and I've got my IP address there. I notice that now my uh, virtual machine is ready and running status. So I'm going to connect to that machine. It'll ask me if I really want to connect. I say yes. And tada, I'm logged onto an Amazon virtual machine. Here I can uh, become the root user, configure the virtual machine, and do any setups I want. Uh, you can look at all uh, the standard Linux distribution, all of the files are there, so you can use that to further configure, set up your virtual machine, run different web services and such. And once you're done, you can log out. Note that the virtual machine continues to run. Even though I'm disconnected from it, it still continues to run, so you can run web servers and such on your virtual machine. And when you want to terminate, you basically come back, go to the instance, and terminate your virtual machine and say, yes, I want to terminate, and that stops your virtual machine. This is how you would use Amazon Web Services or Google Web Services and Google Grid Engine to create your own virtual machines and configure software on it and use cloud computing solutions. Let's do a quick summary of what we learned in this presentation. Cloud computing essentially furthers virtualization on virtual machines. It improves efficiency due to sharing of resources. Cloud computing enables elastic computing by allowing a user to dynamically spin up or shut down virtual machines based on demand. A cloud is essentially housed in a data center, which is nothing but a big room with a whole bunch of machines. There are different types of clouds, public, private, community, and hybrid clouds. Cloud computing companies provide different levels of service depending on what the user needs are. Software as a service is the most simplest and easy to use, but it's not flexible or customizable. Platform as a service is the intermediate. You have some flexibility uh, and some uh, customization options. Infrastructure as service is the most flexible option where you just get a virtual machine and you can set up any operating system or software that you want on top of that. We looked at an example of using a cloud company's website to spin up a virtual machine and it's relatively straightforward and you can use the same approach with other companies and spin up your own virtual machines and start working on the cloud.